the first rains are approaching winter and they've already soaked the Gaza Strip. It compounds the misery of thousands of Palestinians who are scrambling to repair their homes after Israel's war on the Strip this summer. And Palestinians had rejoiced when billions of dollars were pledged at the International Aid Conference. But many fear that, as was the case after past years, much of that money will never be seen. Rian Clementson brings us this story of how struggle is turning to despair as winter fast approaches the Gaza Strip. No one disputes the need is urgent. The United Nations say 18,000 homes were destroyed or damaged in the 50 days of fighting. 108,000 people are still homeless in this long, impoverished and isolated territory. Local businessmen say reconstruction materials are blocked from Gaza because of red tape. Any help could not come soon enough for Samir Hassanain. A gaping hole in his damaged home exposes his sitting room to the elements despite desperate efforts to shield it with plastic sheeting and bricks. Look, since this morning we've become very wet from the rain. It's winter, we can't live inside the tent anymore. Samir's neighbourhood in Shajaya was shredded by Israeli artillery fire. For almost two months, he and his family have stayed on, eager not to stray far and miss a delegation who visit the area to register homes in need of repair. Earlier this month, an international aid conference pledged nearly $5.5 billion in aid to help rebuild Gaza, but only 75 truckloads of building materials have entered Gaza since then. At this rate, economists say it will take 15 to 20 years to address the problem. Israel has imposed a strict blockade on Gaza, saying it seeks to restrict goods that could be used in weapons production. But this has worsened economic hardship in a dilapidated, arid territory where more than half of the population depend on UN food aid. Donors have backed Palestinian efforts to build an economy capable of statehood in the occupied West Bank, with the hope that a unity pact will help buoy Gaza's shattered fortunes. But analysts say that's nowhere near enough. If they open the crossings for 24 hours, we will need more than three years to rebuild Gaza. But if the situation stays similar to before, the offensive will need 10 years. We are taking three to 10 years, and this is something the people of Gaza won't accept and can't bear. Residents of Gaza's Khan Yunus protested last week, demanding their homes are rebuilt. During summer, at least I can sleep under a tree. I can have a tent, but during winter, I can't. Palestinian officials have put the cost of physical rebuilding at 4 billion but donors allocated only around $2.7 billion towards it. The rest of its pledges are for the cash-strapped budget. There are those who look at these numbers cynically. Many are well aware that the last time there was an Israeli war on Gaza, large amounts of money pledged to help rebuild the Strip were never seen. That's incredibly sad. I mean, mm. if you, when you think about all the people that have that, uh, that need, you know, to actually make the donation and then it... it, it <laughs> And it doesn't necessarily, I mean, it's sad. Yeah. It's just sad. I suppose that's it. There's all these international pressures that people face. Yeah. And money and then really, that's, There's so that's many a, factors. Indeed. Well, look, that, that's the issue of the issue of aid actually reaching those it was attended to is one at the heart of many debates around charity. And luckily now we're joined by one person who can answer all our questions on the matter. The fundraising manager for London for the charity Islamic Relief is here. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Living the Life, Sultan Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, Sultan. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, we've got some, you know, we've got some young guys here who've been yeah. working really hard. It's great to see these guys uh, take part in the Charity Week initiative. Does it make you proud as somebody, you know, who's professionally working in this area? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I remember back in my time when I was uni, I was, I was involved in Charity back Week in myself. My <laughs> back in the days. Back in the days. Since my uni days, a lot has changed. You know? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, you know, being involved in Charity Week in itself is, is something really, really great. Mm -hmm. And of course, what better time than to be studying and doing something in your spare time to get involved in the work of charity, to, to get that experience of going out there, doing something really, really worthwhile for that will benefit someone in need mm -hmm. in per places like Gaza, Syria, and other parts of the world where the, the needy can benefit. And of course, it's, uh, I, I feel proud myself because when I see these students coming forward and really getting down to planning the whole thing, it's not mm -hmm. just about raising money. No. It's all about pre-planning, getting down to the, uh, uh, you know, to the marketing, to putting the logistics together, uh, putting uh, the proper marketing plan, get this uh, whole charity campaign 
on the road. Absolutely. It's, so, it's, it's a big, uh, big experience for these hey, students. Just laugh, so one thing I've noticed, whenever I've met with a lot of the charities in the UK, not just Muslim, but non-Muslim as well, the volunteers and people who engage in charities tend to be a lot older. They're normally people who've retired. Yeah. And they say, right, I've got more time on my hand, now I'll get involved. What's the secret? You've got these young kids, mashallah, they're all university students, and they're saying, right, I'm going to give up this whole week and, and I want to do this work. It's, it's all, they're, they're all very passionate. From, what, from the, all the students that I've met and all the volunteers that we've got, everyone is so passionate about doing something and using their time to do something really, really good. And this is down to, number one, our religion, the religion of Islam. It teaches us to be charitable, it teaches us to be really, really active. And even in Islam, it said that one of the questions we'll be asked in the Day of Judgment is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you youth, mm. and what have you done with that How youth? How do you spend your youth? How do you spend yeah. your youth? And this is a very, very important question. Even in uh, uh, a lot of these students, they, they are very, very generous when it comes to giving. But when it comes to uh, action, they're also at the forefront of our community. Now, the big question, Sulban, right, and I'm sure a lot of people will want to know, you know the specifics of this. Now, this year at charity, I think last year six hundred thousand uh, pounds were raised. We're aiming to go beyond that with charity week this year. How will the money be spent? This year, the money is going towards uh, orphan projects and uh, needy children around the world. Last year, I believe the projects uh, funded uh, children's project in Syria, and this year, of course, is is open because of the number of disasters and mm -hmm. number of conflict areas we've got. So we're keeping it very generic, and all the money that that's being raised from charity, inshallah, will raise over £600,000 this year. Inshallah, inshallah. And, uh, of course, we've got many, many projects around the world that are geared towards education, geared towards children, needy children. And, of course, we've got uh, uh, over uh, 30,000 children that we're sponsoring, orphan mm -hmm. children around the world. And they, of course, need uh, constant support and constant um, funding. Absolutely. No, no, Hisham, obviously, you, know, you guys will be raising all this money. Um, you know, you've obviously selected Islamic Relief as that part. What was it about Islamic Relief that you said, look, this is the organization for us? And Mashra, was it 11 years on, still working with Islamic Relief? What does it for you? Uh, I think... <laughs> We're the best charity. <laughs> In a nutshell. In a nutshell. Um, I, th I think it's, it's a bit of a difficult question just because, um, you know, Hamda, when we started off, uh, Islamic Relief has been there since day one, you know, supporting us, providing us, you know, help in many, many ways, many ways. And I think it's, you know, it's that constant support and the fact that they've been with us for such a long time, you know, it has been 11 years, that's a substantial amount of time. And, you know, like, you know, the brother mentioned, you know, biggest, you know, one of the biggest charities, Muslim charity, what is the biggest Muslim charity. And, you know, it's, it's really in terms of all the things that we wanted, they have Alhamdulillah delivered to us. And, you know, we were just really grateful for that aspect. And obviously, you know, inshallah, we hope to, you know, continue and, you know, have stronger bonds with Islam, inshallah, inshallah. In the years to come. Now, if I can come back to you, Sultan, right now, a lot of people who donate to Charity Week or any other charity initiative, uh, maybe you could talk generically about donations that are coming. It's very rare that people kind of follow up on their donation and see exactly what happened or how that money was used. Is this something that we should be doing more of? Of course. I mean, accountability is one of the uh, biggest factors in any charity. Mm -hmm. And Islamic Relief has become the size that is today purely because of the work that we've done and because of how accountable we've been. Mm -hmm. uh, we've worked uh, very closely with the European Union, with the UK government, and these institutions don't come to charities unless you've got your uh, paperwork in order. Of course. And of course we encourage all our donors to ask questions if they have any doubts. Mm -hmm. And every penny that you spend with charities, it's mm -hmm. your right to ask questions. How is that money being spent? And of course every year we uh, publish our annual reports where we mention our projects, how much money has been spent mm -hmm. in all the projects. And uh, through documentaries, through Islam Channel, through many other media channels, we do feedback to our donors what that money has been spent, what kind of projects that, uh, that have been delivered through the donor's money. So there is accountability, so there's a way, course, there's a yeah. direct portal for people we've to got, find we've out. We've got a whole accountability framework that's, that's, brilliant. that's you know, See, pointed towards that's the... That's excellent. Yeah. That should get people donating more because they course, know exactly yeah. how that money is being used. You have more of an incentive that way. And just on the subject of finding out more, um, uh, Sultan, if I can ask you, people who want to know more about Islamic Relief or find out more about Charity Week as a campaign, how can they find out more information? Yeah, if you want to find out more about Islamic Relief, we've got a website, www.islamic-relief.org.uk. Uh, we've, al we've also got regional offices around the UK. Uh, our office is in, in London. The London South office is in Whitechapel, right opposite the masjid. Mm -hmm. uh, we're there uh, most days in the week. 
uh, you can always pop, pop down, have a conversation with us. And also through different events. Um, Charity Week, mashallah, they've got events throughout the UK, all the students getting together, especially London, mashallah, we've got a record number of universities taking part this Fantastic. year. Mashallah. So, uh, yeah, that's another way of getting in touch with us. Of course, engage with us, come to the dinners, you know, give us some support, show these students some support by attending the dinners, and of course, uh, paying us, uh, donating us. And much of course, you've got a live appeal coming up as well? Yes, inshallah, on Saturday, inshallah, live appeal. Inshallah. First, uh, first time we've ever doing this, um, you know, bra brand new thing, and um, so inshallah, hopefully it'll go. What's your website that people can visit to find um, out? You can go to onechartweek.com, um, just type of, obviously into the website, alternative, you can go to Facebook, and again, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, you know, majority uh, social, social media. Networks. Yeah. One charity. Really Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys, for, uh, okay. for joining us, and stay with us. Indeed. Now, embracing responsibility is a theme of a new fashion show in the Colombian capital. It's getting fashion-conscious people to sit up and pay attention to homelessness. Sadia Chaudhary brings us the story of how a shopping centre is bringing Bogota's homeless residents from the sidewalk to the catwalk. Homelessness is a game of numbers here in the Colombian capital. A city of 8 million people has an estimated 9,000 who sleep rough. Bogota's homeless have long been documented for being forced to sleep in the sewers. Colombia has made headlines for the advances it has made in recent years in bringing to an end a 50-year-old civil war. But society here still has a far distance to travel in order to improve the lot of the economically marginalized. Among Colombia's major cities, only two offer any service for the homeless. And if the capital is aiming to set a trend, it appears to have found the answer in fashion. An industry that's notorious for attracting attention is now being used to shine the spotlight on an issue that most people look away from. The Sabana Plaza shopping centre in the heart of the Colombian capital has put on a fashion show which features homeless residents of the city. Six people, all under the age of 28, took part in what's being described as a responsibility initiative. They're being given a makeover and learning how to strut their style on a catwalk. It's all aimed at helping them move away from a life on the streets and into something that could pave the way for a career. The models are part of a group of some 200 homeless Bogotans who sleep on the drug-ridden Cinco Ecos street by the plaza. Fidel has spent 14 years of his life addicted to drugs. He says it's important to raise awareness about the marginalized sections of society. If drugs reach someone you know, don't hurt them, don't mistreat them and don't send them away. Learn how to deal with it, because after the vice takes you for a ride, know that it's very hard to leave. The mall has hired fashion and beauty experts to help prepare the homeless models. Classes focus on runway etiquette, among other things. There's always been respect. Working with the homeless was very rewarding, but also at times difficult, because they're people who take drugs, and so they're easily distracted. The simple fact of knowing that there will be crowds watching us makes me nervous. But that's true for anyone who is homeless because society treats you with barriers or giant walls. This event is breaking those issues down. The organizers say the project was done in close cooperation with the homeless. And in a sign that the initiative is already becoming fashionable, one social integration organization has announced that it'll send a team to give psychological counseling services for the homeless communities that the Sabana Shopping Center is working with. I Amazing. like that. That's really good. Really, really good idea, though. I think yeah. you need a bit of innovation. I know Bidder's bad, but you know, in this case, it's all right. <laughs> this is good Bidder. This is good Bidder Hassana. You know, good innovation when it comes to aid work. Absolutely. Especially having some kind of psychosocial support there as well. I thought, yeah, really good. Because you don't think about it. You just think, well, it's a bit, it's a bit counterintuitive, really, to take homeless people put yeah. them in a fashion show. But the idea is it's quite nice because it is psychologically reaffirming, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, um, guys. From, uh, from Charity Week, we'll ask you guys, right, you've got some unusual things going on for Charity Week. Obviously, we talked earlier about, you know, some of the things that were happening. Uh, we had the treasure uh, the treasure hunt as well. Why is it so important to have these different creative ideas when it comes to fundraising? I, th I think essentially just kind of, uh, you know, 
In terms of motivation, it you know, motivates you every single year. In terms of, you know, this year we've got like a brand new tagline, you know, our theme's different and we constantly update our theme as the years go by. You know, this one's obviously unity is the key. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, essentially it is, is to kind of motivate the, you know, the volunteers. It's always to, you know, make sure that we're constantly expanding. It's not, so you don't stay consistent in the sense that it's just, you know, the same thing again and again and again, mm -hmm. that you're constantly trying to, you know, get better and st stronger. And obviously that, the, a key of, you know, the, the way of doing that usually is in terms of you know, marketing, in terms oh, yeah. of doing different events, making sure that you are out there you know, trying new things, such as you know, obviously, inshallah, our you know, live appeal that we have on, mm -hmm. going on Saturday as well, inshallah. Something so. different, Something absolutely. Different